Hi everyone. Um, just a, a quick show of hands. Who is kind of technical here? No, you are not Don. You are totally not technical. Who's more on the like the legal policy side? Right. No, you are not Don. <laughs> Anyways, um, so this this part will be a little bit more. I, I can. Keep it high level, I can also dive deep. I just watch your eyes when you're drifting off, I'll just jump back. Um, what today we'll be looking at is uh, one part of the ocean ecosystem. I think it's kind of the glue that fits all these services together so you can create interesting compute pipelines. Think about, um, think about how to create a virtual human agent, uh, something that mimics a human. What, what would it need? It would need some data, of course. It needs to recognize objects in the world, so it needs to have image data. But it also wants to listen and speak, so it needs to have semantics. It needs to know about maybe um, connotation, context. So you're going to need different types of data models, different types of neural networks, all working together into a supply chain. In the end, what comes out is something that's trained on multiple facets of data and then becomes something that's polyvalent. So these, th these things, these supply chains, uh, they happen in the physical space, but also in the virtual space, in the service space. And that means that what we try to do is hook all these things together. And that basic piece to glue these things together is what we call service e execution agreements. It's kind of modeled, as Don said, after service level agreements, but then we couldn't make the acronym C, so we kind of ocean seas, right? yeah, I guess. Um, so first of all, there, I want to just show you what our service levels in the real world, like we have them now. And well, there is one server that just got put down, and it's the oldest server running for 24 years, nonstop, never rebooted. Um, so if this is kind of the holy grail of service levels. So 24 years, I try to beat that. What happens if you don't be, uh, meet those requirements, like the uptime of a service? Say, what happens if the, the internet goes out? And right? somebody has to pay for uh, current losses and, and all these things. So what, for example, Microsoft did was, well, they have outage, they had an outage with their Xbox, so they basically reimbursed the gamers with a new game. That's something you can do. That's basically saying, if something goes wrong, we will make sure that you get rewarded or get reimbursed. Now, typically, we're looking at these types in the cloud, and we're looking at these types of things where you look at uptime. Hey, if a service goes down, it's downtime. If it stays up, it's uptime. And we're, most of these cloud services, they're targeting 99.95% percent and more uptime. So this means that it's only a few hours <laughs> per year that that server can go down. Otherwise, they have to start paying their customers with some retribution. So here, of course, these cloud providers have been tokenized way before uh, Bitcoin. Uh, they have credits. Um, and they would reimburse credits to people. Typically, it's around 10 to 25 percent. Depends on the downtime of the service. So we're looking at these types of things. It's easy to encode. You just measure when the server is up or down. You can ping the server, and then you basically put that in a legal agreement, goes to procurement, and has all these people involved to reimburse. What we're trying to do is take that model of mutual protection between somebody consuming a service and somebody providing a service, and remove the human as much as possible and make this decentralized in the sense that it's error tolerant and automated. Now, if we're looking at machine learning, we're not looking at uptime as being the main qualifier of performance. Yeah? What we're looking at is, for example, that you provide the right format of data or the right format of your model. Are we using the same type of language in columns? If I have a hidden data set, and you bring me a model, how, does that, how well does that model perform on my data set? Can I compute an error? And if that error is below a certain degree, maybe your model isn't good enough. 
Or what about GDPR? And maybe we can agree that in a case where I don't want to leak my data because it's sensitive data, then I cannot expose that data. So then I have to bring the compute towards my data center. I have to make sure that I'm never exposing personal identifiable data. And that can all be encoded in some fashion. So for example, for the latter, you could say that, well, imagine a data set, an algorithm, they walk into a bar and start negotiating. Like, hey, the algorithm says, oh, you have such sweet data. Uh, let me consume you. And then the data provider says, no, my data shall not leak because it has a lot of sensitive information in it. Well, would you mind me running at your site? I won't tell anyone. And then the data provider says, sure, but then we need to have some zero knowledge. I, uh, I will encrypt everything, and we're going to do a zero knowledge compute on it, and it's going to li limit the capabilities of the model that you're going to do. Right? I can do that. Can you support my model? Sure. And then you get this negotiation phase. So that could be a scenario that we think that we either template or we have dynamically f establishing in service agreements. But it could also be just a performance function. Is, that's the reason why we're thinking about modularity in these things, because different application domains will have different performance functions, different SLAs, different types of services. So what it comes down to in most of the times is resolve disputes between two parties. One party is not super happy, and the other party says, uh, well, it's not my fault. So this is a slide that Don kind of uh, showed. We have a lot of players in the market. Um, we think resource pooling is one way to get rid of silos. Um, so we'll have, instead of these big cloud providers having their legal instances, like these armies of legals setting up these policies and these SLAs, what if everybody could have an SLA? That means you can basically convert all your assets, which might be cost centers, into profit centers, because now you can expose your data with having a security of some legal policy attached to it, or at least some automated dispute resolution. <laughs> but we're basically looking at a chicken or egg problem. Um, is it, am I going to pay for the service up front, or am, am I going to deliver the data after I get paid, or the other way around. There is, there is no really a starting point here. And there is always the fact that people can point to each other and not, there's not really a court in place that can say, well, I look at the evidence. Um, according to my expert knowledge, I think this party is in the right and this party is in the wrong. And a lot of things can go wrong. If you look at cloud services, for example, uh, a consumer never paid or forgot to pay for access. Maybe he never used the access and said, well, I did use the access, but never did. Maybe the access request never got through, through authorization. Maybe the actual service delivered just wasn't good enough or never yielded an outcome. Or maybe that result that from the service never uh, made its way back to the consumer. So there's a lot of unhappy parts in this system. So one way to go about this is having an intermediary. Now, we don't want to have a bank or a legal company in the middle because we have something like a decentralized ledger that can resolve disputes and it has high availability. So the fact that these contracts can be deployed on uh, smart uh, contract uh, technology, this means that this will always execute according to the rules that are encoded in here. So that's going to be a bit of a trick. How can we make those rules solid? How can we make them um, non-disputable? So think about the following scenario, where we mutually protect a provider and a consumer by holding funds, like token or a payment, into an escrow account. An escrow account is basically, you could say, it's similar as something if you would buy a house, for example. Then you use an escrow account, you put the money right there, it hasn't been transferred yet to the buyer, to, to the seller of the house, until the seller of the house presents the title and the ownership rights to be transferred to the other party. Once that happens, the bank come in the, comes in the middle or the notary comes in the middle and says, that, well, I'm going to do that swap for you guys. 
Now, these things can be easily implemented in smart contracts. So what you could do is the consumer can lock up his payment into this smart contract. And depending on the performance of a service, it could either pay out, or if the performance was bad, it could reimburse the, the consumer. So this kind of techniques means, well, we have to choose one or the other. We have to choose whether the service was green and, and did perform well, or it was red and didn't perform well. Now, the question is, who's going to be resolving that dispute? Hmm? <laughs> That's why we have to have a set of conditions. It's a little bit like terms and conditions in, um, in regular agreements or SLA, saying that, well, that was at 1% uptime, or that is that type of performance we expected from a, smart, uh, from a, a machine learning model. And we can encode these things so that they're deterministic, and a computer can check them off. And then the computer can also make a decision, yes or no. Execute or abort a payment, for example. Now, sometimes these conditions are easy to check. Was it signature correct? Was it hashing uh, the right value? Uh, was access control actually granted? Uh, did that signature came from a trusted instance? Sometimes it's a bit more difficult, and we're looking at um, something we call compute attestations or proofs of, we call it proofs of service, which, could, which basically are cryptographic proofs that you did a computation or you delivered data, and they're basically quite complex, so you need dedicated software and maybe hardware to do so. So you could argue that, for example, things like Bitcoin miners, they're dedicated hardware, they perform a quite not sophisticated, but quite intensive proof. And they would verify the entire network and basically say which one of, in the Bitcoin case, it would say which one of the transactions is valid, which ones of the blocks is valid. Now, once you go a level above, you enter into the human space, where you say, well, there is subjectiveness to the matter. It's not any more deterministic computation. It's basically fluffy. Um, it depends on previous um, results. Uh, let me think of a, a scenario where, for example, you compute a model and a model that trains maybe at 5% accuracy. And your service level is around 5%. And it's just a little bit lower. So you could argue maybe it's due to the data that was tested upon. And then you might have a, f a few people that are expert matters, and they sign off whether it's true or false. If you really go into more complicated cases, at some point you want to have something like judging, like really legal courts in a digital space. There's things like Materium, Clearos. There's dedicated pro uh, projects in the decentralized space that are looking at dispute resolution at almost the legal side. So what we want to avoid is too much of this and resolve as much as possible at the lowest side. So if our service agreements can cover 99% of the cases up to here, then it never really hits the human. So a lot of overhead is worked away. So the service agreements themselves, where do they reside? Well, between every party that's basically in a supply chain. So everybody that is connecting to a supply chain will expose a service agreement. And they, these service agreements themselves, they are residing on what we call keepers. But this could be Ethereum, this could be a proof of authority network, or some other type of um, decentralized le ledger. So these are just smart contracts. And everybody that's exposing a service and connects it to a supply chain will deploy a contract or instantiate a contract onto this smart contract ledger. In Ocean Protocol, we started thinking, well, which ones are useful for our system? So it kind of depends on what's the use case. I try to map here what's the difference between services in the cloud and services in the decentralized space. So a service in the cloud would have these typical these service level agreements, legal contracts in place, and there would be humans validating these, these things. If you go one level further, then this service 
also, besides doing its typical request response, also delivers cryptographic material that could be signatures, could be hashes, and basically saying that, well, I can cryptographically prove that I did a service. This can be posted into a smart contract, and then people could start checking whether that is legit or not. If you go one step further, you have the same type of service here, but you have a set of automated validators here, which basically can do signature checks, hashing algorithms, they can do other type of things, and they're sometimes dedicated hardware, sometimes they're not. If you go to fully decentralized technology, then all, there are multiple services doing the same thing. There is a form of replication. Think about Bitcoin uh, or Ethereum. They have more than 1,000 nodes doing actually the same service, validating transactions and smart contracts. And at the same time, they're also validating all these things. And they add incentives for people to do so. So we have to start somewhere. So what we do is we kind of take parts of this where we have Web 2.0 services with uh, additional cryptography. And we're also looking at Web 3.0 services, which automatically do that cryptography layer themselves. And then we provide in Ocean our own verifier network that can verify, verify compute services, data services, whatnot. Now, in order to set up a contract here, a smart contract, an SLA, or a service agreement, everybody's going to have its own kind of wants and needs. You could say a service provider, he wants to get paid. Um, and that can be said by, well, if you lock up the reward in such of one of those escrow contracts, then I will grant you access. A consumer says, well, I will only want to pay you if you actually deliver the service. And that service got verified by a verification network. The verifier themselves might say that, well, I will verify if somebody gives me a reward and I actually have material to verify. So all of these things have to come together in a single agreement, because in the end, it's still an agreement with multiple parties. But all of these things we can encode into smart contract language. And that's what we basically did. We have if you look at the structure of a service agreement, in, in our case, it's quite simple. We point to the service, which is just an identifier. This could basically say that if you resolve this identifier, you end up in an Amazon cloud service or in an IPFS uh, URL, or maybe in some Enigma cluster. Could be anything. And then the conditions, that's the tricky part. Here is where we want to apply cryptographic proofs and challenges to say that if you can provi provide We'll set up a few challenges for each party involved. And if you can solve that challenge with cryptographic material, then you will get a positive. And what happens if you do so? Well, then you get a reward. How that reward function looks like, that's also very dependent on the use case. I'll give a few use cases of reward functions, because here you can be very clever. We already talked about this escrow function, where it's execute or abort. But there could be other interesting things there. Um, first of all, well, a bit of background on what this little line says. Basically, is a, an identifier. That identifier points to some material saying that, well, this is a service that you're going to use. Here are the endpoints. This is the agreement we are going to use. And here you can listen to events. So this is material that doesn't have to go on chain, but describes how the service will look like. So if I'm a service provider, let's say I have um, a data set on Azure, and I want to put this in the market, what I can do is I can describe, well, go to this Azure URL, and you're going to need this type of authentication. And I'm going to attach a service agreement that says that you first have to pay, and then you get granted access. This all goes together, gets published, and then your asset is available on the marketplace. Then a consumer comes in, he queries the marketplace looking for some interesting data. Oh, he found this one. Now what we want to do is get that agreement, sign it from both parties. Maybe I do a payment, and then I get granted access to this cloud or Web3 service. So that's kind of the full flow. Um, 
The second part is, of course, where all these parties have to start entering their agreements, uh, their, their conditions, their terms and conditions of how will they perform, and then also provide the cryptographic material to do that performance. We call it conditions, the challenges, and fulfillment, which is basically solving that challenge. Um, an easy one would be saying that a condition could be a hash. And if you know the pre-image or the nonce or the, the, the plain text that will hash towards that specific hash, then you solve that challenge. Another condition could be, for example, um, setting a public key. I just post a public key and say that if somebody provides a signature, a signed message with this public key, he has proven that he has a private key or she has a private key. Other things could be, for example, using multi-signatures, saying that if three out of five signatures enter, uh, then we hit a certain threshold and then this validation function also becomes true. In the end, what you want to see is that all of these things become true. So, for example, if we look at this, a consumer has to pay. So one of the conditions would be lock up the tokens in the contract. Secondly, uh, maybe let's say uh, a curator, which is somebody that looks for data, has to sign um, a certain message and he provides a signature, goes into that agreement, also turns into green. Maybe a provider who's still pending, didn't do anything useful. So that kind of becomes unknown, not yet validated. Maybe a verifier just failed to fulfill his job and then it's just red alert and, and nothing comes through. Well, given that your um, conditions of fulfillment or whatever terms and conditions can be either false, true or unknown, this means that you can also play with your reward function here. If these people didn't perform well, they might not get paid. If they performed half, they might get 50% of the reward. Or think about streams. If you have like data streams or uh, any type of queuing material or service um, event buses, then it's continuous. So what you could do is say that this payment function would always refresh itself and say that I'm waiting for a chunk. If the chunk gets validated, you get a chunk of payment. So you have to basically say that, well, I'm going to top up my wallet. Chunks of payments going to go off. I get always a new chunk because I paid for it. And at some point, my balance is empty. And then it might emit an event, hey, you wa might want to top up your balance. So these are payment schemes. And we can also think, for example, about, um, let's say, Kaggle. Kaggle is a data science platform where it's all about competitions. So somebody would write out a competition saying that, hey, we have this interesting problem. For example, we want to know when an asteroid is going to hit the Earth. What we will provide is some test data where you can see uh, imagery from satellites looking at the sky. What we want you to do is take a model and point out which is a potential asteroid that might hit the Earth. Um, the reward might be 100,000 euros, for example. And who's going to get the reward? Well, maybe the person that submits a model that validates and has a certain accuracy attached to it. So this type of competitions would happen in a reward function. And that's how you also could price data by itself. It's difficult to price data because you don't know what the asset is valued. But it's easier to price a problem because you know what that problem is causing you as a headache or in your business center. So turning it around relieves us a little bit some in, in, in such cases from data pricing problems. Yeah, this is just putting everything together. Um, I'm going to skip this. This is kind of technical. I just want to show that there is an unknown state in our conditions or challenges. It's basically saying that um, it's not because, it, let's say, we take the hashing problem. You give a hash, and if somebody can find the nonce that computes to that hash, then that basically is valid. But as long as that nonce hasn't been found, doesn't mean that nobody's going to find the nonce. It just means that it hasn't been found yet. So you have to account for an unknown value, which leads to interesting tri-state logic. And sometimes that 
Well, that's really technical details, but that's definitely resolvable. What we did is we, we took a few basic cryptographic primitives and we started combining them into more complex compound things that are useful for data services, like access control, multi-sig uh, payments, timeouts, and that you can combine into voting scenarios, into oracles, etc. The more you go to this, the more complex it becomes, the more difficult it becomes to execute and to make flawless. At this site, you're kind of safe. At this site, you need more audits. Um, yeah, this is, I'm also gonna uh, skip this. What I wanna show you is, if this service agreement gets kicked off, there's a few events in its life that's gonna happen. For example, a provider says, well, here's a service agreement. I will put it in place. Now you need to pay, basically put money in the agreement, and then I will provide access to my service. And once that access is granted and validated, I will get a reward, which is basically that payment you gave in the beginning. So time goes in this direction. What happens if you didn't give access and a timeout happens? Then that money flows back to the consumer. So what we did is we programmed this into smart contract language. That each of these events basically get concatenated and become a life cycle of a service agreement. We can go more interesting and, and difficult where this, let's say we have a stream of data coming out or a stream of compute and regularly you have to post a challenge that you can solve showing that you actually are still delivering the service. So this means this service now and then has to post a proof to this contract. Somebody that knows how to validate that proof, he might also be able to get a reward, will put a validation on there and this will go back and forth. So your service agreement basically becomes this event timeline of provenance, things that happened on that service. And you can prove it because it's all cryptographically validated at these ends. Now, it might get tough for a blockchain. So what we do is we put a lot of these validator proof things into sidechains. Sidechains are basically, they dissolve after a time. Um, they're not, not always persistent, but for its local networks, momentaneous. Putting it all together, so you have, you're a provider, you basically publish your service, it gets um, searched and found, and then you start kicking off your service agreements, and you have either payouts or no payouts, depending on the performance. So that's kind of how you tie all these things together. I guess we're close to the end. Um, what we are looking at now, and this is parts of it are in research, and you can see it's mostly the proof layers looking at cryptographic sound proofs to make sure that this service network that you don't necessarily trust can actually ha deliver cryptographic proofs that you granted access for somebody to consume your service or somebody granted, uh, made a data asset available for everybody to download. This could be useful for the commons, for example. Or making a proof that says that, well, I can prove that you actually trained my model on your data set or tested it on your data set. And we're also looking a lot into sidechain oracles. Why? Because there's a lot of other decentralized networks doing one thing really well and we need to glue them together. So we kind of have to look into that other network, could be let's say Filecoin, Enigma, what have you, and see if the service actually gets computed well, what's the dispute resolution at that ledger, and then just take the outcome. We don't have to do much work but we could just have to take what ha uh, the outcome of the events right there. So these are the things that we're still doing. And well, if you're interested in them, we can definitely have a little chat about these things. There's also a lot of reading material. Uh, I posted, we'll post the slides as well. So this kind of documents all the steps we took. It also documents the actual implementations and you also find the code on GitHub of many of these things. Yeah, and then that's it. I think maybe you have, I, I, I so overdid my time probably. <laughs> All right, so if you have one or two questions, we, and then we'll give the mic to Troy. No questions? Oh, there is. Yeah? Like, can you give me a situation how like a negotiation could happen or is 
between a consumer and a provider? Yeah, yeah. Um, so we're, we're, in that case, let's, let's talk about privacy preserving machine learning, which is a super interesting case saying that um, I want people, this, this is something that attracts a lot of companies saying, that, well, I want data scientists in my data centers but I don't want to expose my data assets towards those data scientists. Um, so such a negotiation could be like you, you ask for access to the data set and they will point you to an endpoint. And then you're looking at that endpoint and you're trying to do a get data on that endpoint. And that will block. It will suggest that you probably have to post your algorithm to that endpoint. And that will then go through. And then it will also say that you can find the result of your job at this endpoint, which is maybe a storage room. So that could be a negotiation, basically pointing to where to, f what to do next. All right. So Troy, I don't know if you have slides.